cold weather if you guys did. If not, uh, you guys decided to stay home today, grab a cup of coffee, sit on the couch. Uh, you're probably the smarter of us. <laughs> so uh, without further ado, we're going to get rolling here. So today we're going to be going, uh, what is wireless wall and what is networking? You know, networking is the foundation of today. I mean, it's one of the fast growing uh, areas in our industry. Um, what that means, I mean, we are, you know, it's over home IT networking, surveillance cameras, multi remote, everything uses wireless. Everything uses networking in general. Uh, so it's something that we need to know about. Uh, and if you decide not to know about it, it's, you're going to be out of business because everything now is networking. And what are integrators installing? IT and home networks, nowadays everything lives on the network. So that goes into almost every installation. So thanks guys for hopping on and, uh, and wanting to learn more because it is a piece of equipment. It's a area that as integrators we all need to know uh, whether we want to or not. So without further ado, we're going to get into wireless. Uh, Wi-Fi is 802.11 uh, protocol overview. There is different frequencies. There's 2.4 single band frequency and there's also a dual band 2.4 and 5 gigahertz frequency. Okay. Uh, the difference, 2.4 goes twice the distance. Reason being, it's half of the, uh, half the band. So you're looking at a lot wider uh, range. So we're going to be able to go through a lot of wider wavelengths. Uh, so it's going to be able to penetrate farther through obstacles and travel farther. Uh, 2.4 is also twice as low as 5 gigahertz. You do the math, you know, it's twice as, twice as uh, half the size. So what does that mean? When you jump up to 5 gigahertz, 5 gigahertz is a lot faster. Reason being, the wavelengths are a lot shorter. It's able to go a lot quicker. Um, now, 5 gigahertz is less crowded. Everything was 2.4. Everything still is 2.4. Uh, with 5 gigahertz, if you can get up to the 5 gigahertz range, you're going to be uh, better with uh, less congestion. Reason being, a lot less things are running on 5 gigahertz range up there right now. Now, when you're looking at the difference, some of the other reasons are 2.4 gigahertz has 11 channels to choose from, 1 through 11. But there is really only three channels in there that are not overlapping. So really, you only have three channels to be able to use in the 2.4 gigahertz range. And that's 1, 6, and 11. Uh, with the 5 gigahertz range, you actually have nine, or eight non-overlapping -overla channels. Um, so a lot more options in the 5 gigahertz range, especially if you guys are doing uh, in the cities or in MDU, apartments, whatever it is, and you have a lot of different Wi-Fi frequencies to fight with and to work with, uh, the 5 gigahertz is going to give you a lot more customization to be able to find that area uh, without any interference. When you talk about wireless, this is a question I get on every call. How far does it go? How much is it going to cover? Okay. And the answer I always give is, it depends. Because I cannot say that this antenna is going to go, let's say, 100, it's going to cover 100 feet. I can't say that because one application may cover 100 feet. Another application may only cover 30. The hardware is the same. But there's things to look at. First of all, depending on the access point, wireless transmission output power. How powerful is the access point you're working with? Not every access point is the same. Signal strength, physical placement, okay, it, it, it depends on where you place this thing. Every building is built differently. Uh, hardware is in different locations. Appliances are in different locations. HVAC is in different locations. So placement is definitely a big thing. Also, number of access points, okay, how much coverage am I going to get? It also depends on the access points as well. 
uh, and environmental factors. Like I said, interference from other outside forces, whether that's uh, in an MDU and you have other uh, wireless frequencies around the area, or construction materials. Is it stick built? Is it spray foamed? Is it steel studs? Uh, is it HVAC? You know, where is the HVAC located? You get big metal tubes running through, you know, which is HVAC. Uh, that affects wireless. Uh, appliances, mirrors are a, a big factor. So there is a lot of things that can affect wireless frequency. Now, we do cover, uh, we carry a couple different options for networking equipment. Um, I choose with this PowerPoint, I talk a lot about Luxville just because that's one of our major partners. It's not the only one that we carry, but they do a great job at uh, presentations and getting them out there. So I'm going to use that when I talk about the Luxville APs. Now, again, if you guys are using Ingenious, Ingenious has one watt outdoor access points or indoor APs. Uh, so you can take it with a grain of salt. But when we talk about Signal strength, okay. AP provides, okay, it's one watt of output power, okay. Ten times output power of traditional access points. So a traditional access point is roughly 100 milliwatts. Now, an outdoor one watt access point, you're going to see, you're going to actually get twice to three times the increased coverage when you go that far or that much higher in power. Now the next question is, is signal strength. What is signal strength? Okay. And what does it mean? So when you look at a signal strength, it goes from 0 dB to negative 100 dB. When you look at something, a gauge, and you see oh, negative 30, negative 40, or even negative 50, some people think, okay, that's half the strength. No, that's actually a really hot signal. Okay. Really, your sweet spot is negative 30 to negative 60. If you start going between down to negative 70 dB, you're going to probably want to put in another access point. Your goal is to get 70 dB or higher. Ideally, 60 dB, negative 60 dB or higher. Okay. Typical, con typical conditions you're going to find when you're walking around house are negative 50 to negative 70 in some spots. When you hit negative 75 dB, okay, I know that it goes down to negative 100, but you're dead. I mean, it drops off like nothing. You may get a signal, but you're probably not going to get really any communication out of it. So just keep that in mind. You start walking around, and you see that you're down to negative 75 dB, you're going to need to add another access point or relocate the access point or wireless router that you already have. So... Um, if you guys have any questions, I forgot to say, if you guys have any questions during this webinar, please post them in, a, in the questions box. Uh, I'll take as much time as needed after the webinar to answer all your guys' questions. So uh, don't feel that you guys can't inject uh, your own thoughts or questions. Uh, I'm going to take as much time as we can to answer everything afterward. Now, Wi-Fi speeds. How many of you guys have installed Wi-Fi or a wireless router or anything else, and you've got a gig coming in, 250 meg, whatever it is coming in, hardwired, and you get great speeds. Well, next thing you know, you log onto your wireless, you're getting half that. Okay, so why am I never getting the speeds advertised in the box? It says it's 1900 AC. Why am I not getting 1900 AC or even 300 N? I got a small little 300 and access point, why am I not getting 300 megabytes per second out of this access point? And this is why. Real speeds are actually only 30 to 50 percent of the max. Okay, so if it says it is a, um, actually I'll show you a graph here in a minute here. Also, Wi-Fi, some of the reasons are Wi-Fi can't transmit and receive at the same time. Okay, it is a half duplex. So that's going to cut down on your transmit speed. Also, speeds depend on a lot of variables. Signal strength. So if you're at negative 30 dB signal strength, you're going to be faster speed than when you're at negative 60 dB signal strength. 
channel utilization also makes a difference on speed. RF interference, number of client devices, AP and client specifications. So your less expensive Android tablet may not be as fast as your iPhone just because the wireless antenna that's built into it. And the biggest thing is, is every environment is different. Okay, you can't do, unless you're doing spec homes where every house is manufactured identically, you cannot go from and design one system and have it work exactly the same in another house or facility. The biggest thing for you guys to know is customer education is key, meaning explaining to your customers what they are actually going to get. You know, if you tell them that you've got a 1900 AC access point going in there and they go up and they find out they're only getting 750 meg or 1000 meg or um, 500 meg because they're on 2.4 out of this access point, they're going to be upset. And so customer education is key. And this is a great graph to show what to actually expect, okay? So when you look at a 1750 AC access point or wireless router, what does that mean, okay? That doesn't mean you're gonna get 1750 megs on 2.4 and 5 gigs. What that means is it's broken up. How do they get that number? Well, that number is 1300 a max, on 5 gigahertz and 450 max on 2.4 gigahertz. You add those together, you get 1750. That's where they get their number. So just keep that in mind. Um, now, does that mean you're actually going to get it? No. Real world speeds, again, are 30 to 50 percent of what is rated. So real world speeds, you're probably going to get 500 because of signal strength, all those things we just talked about. Uh, 500 megs on the 5 gigahertz and probably 120 megs, give or take, on the 2.4. It's just the way it works, wireless, the way wireless works, guys. Um, if it's av you know, advertised as a 1750 AC access point, you're not going to get 1750 out of one band. And when if you guys are out there specking, the 300 n access points or the 600 n access points. I mean, a 600 n is a two by two. That's 300 megs max on five gigs, 300 megs max on um, 2.4. That's 120 on five gigahertz, 90 on 2.4 real world. So with that in mind, if they've got 250 meg coming into the house, they may not be happy with what they're getting wireless. Now, how do you measure signal strength? There are some really great tools on how to measure signal strength. If you guys have a win, you know, using a laptop or an Android, Insider is an amazing tool. It will show you every SSID in the area. It'll show you what channel they're on and what their signal strength is. So when you're initially setting up your wireless, definitely you want to do your research ahead of time and see what the different frequencies are in the area, what the, what's out there. Um, also, if you're doing Windows, uh, laptop, acrylic, Wi-Fi Explorer on Mac, or Apple, iPad, iPhone, they don't like to play well. They don't, for some reason, they don't like to give you the, these tools to be able to go out and look. But they have an ability um, with Apple Airport Utility, if you download the app, and go into the settings, you can actually turn on Wi-Fi scanner. It's not going to give you as much info as Insider, but at least it'll give you the, the SSIDs in the area and the signal strength. So it is a great little tool if you're using uh, an Apple. Now let's talk about access point placement. Most access points, indoor access points, are omnidirectional, meaning they're going to go even coverage throughout in all directions. So when you're looking at an access point placement for this house, we're not going to put it in the office in the corner because it only covers half the house. 
if we put it in the center, it's going to cover the whole house, but you may still want to see how it's just barely covering the edges. And in an off place like this, I would actually probably put in two access points, one on either side to cover both, um, cover the whole house more evenly. We've talked about interference. And this is a great example of what interference will look like. So here's a house that's built, very simple house. We place an access point in that room, in the bedroom. Take a look at what it does. The walls are metal studs. Okay. So look at the way the actual signal really covers this house. You can't just draw a big circle around the access point. This is what it's going to cover. So keep in mind metal, elevators, insulation, water features, stone, stucco, you know, sound dampening, windows and mirrors, exterior wall insulation. You know, all of these things have a huge effect on wireless. So it's great to know and ask questions. What are these walls built of? You know, um, where's the HVAC ran? You can usually get an idea where it's ran. Uh, are there bedroom closets, you know, lined with mirrors? All of this stuff affects wireless. So this is really a great example on where you should probably actually put two access points. One on either corner of the house and use a wireless controller, which we'll get into here in a minute. Wireless roaming. Then you need to use a second access point when you're looking at that last picture. Okay, You need to take into account wireless roaming. What is wireless roaming? Wireless roaming, roaming is a wireless network that occurs when a wireless client changes from access point to access point. Okay, so when you're walking from one side of the house to the other, it goes to, connects to the other access point. Now, how does wireless roaming work? This is actually what it does. Okay, roaming is a client's decision. The client is responsible for deciding when it needs to roam, then detecting, evaluating, and roaming to another access point. What that means, it's not up to the access point. It is up to your phone. It is up to your iPad. It is up to your tablet, your laptop. Whatever wireless device is being used, that's what ma that device is, makes the decision on when to move to the other one, which makes it really hard to know to jump from one access point to the other. And why does it make it hard? Because most devices, when they're connected to an access point, they hold on to that access point. They don't want to jump to another one because they already have a signal. Okay? And they don't know they may not even know that there's another access point around until they disconnect from one and they have to rescan for the other. So getting that handoff, you may still be connected with one bar while you're almost standing underneath another access point. So when it's client roaming only, take a look what happens. Okay, this phone is connected to the first access point, and it's at negative 45 dB, which should be connected to the first access point. But what happens? It starts roaming, and it's now 50 dB. It's close to the other access point, right? But it's still connected to the first access point because it still sees it, even though it should jump to the other. It doesn't. So how do we resolve the issue? Okay, there are many systems out there that have a wireless controller. Okay, whether that's built into the access points, whether that's a hard device, whether that's built into the router or to a switch. With one access point, you can roam the whole house, obviously, and never be connected. Now, with the wireless controller, it gives you the ability to set up and manage your access points, wireless roam assisting, uh, 
the Luxel can support up to 16 access points. There are others out there uh, that can do 50, 250, you know, and go on. Uh, when should I use an access point, or I mean a wireless controller? Anytime you have more than one access point, or if you have a wireless router and you want to add an access point, anytime you have more than one place to be able to connect to wirelessly, you need to have a wireless controller. Otherwise, you'll it'll what will happen is it's going to hold on to one before it jumps to the other access point or the wireless router. Uh, and it's not going to be a pleasant situation for the end user. Now with the wireless controller, what it does, it sees both the access points. It tells the APs what to do. And when it's on one AP and the device goes to the other AP, the wireless controller actually tells the access point to disconnect from that, that device. So it cuts off the communication from that access point to the other, to the phone, so the phone has to connect to the other access point. Okay. And whether this is cloud-based, these devices, the access points, are using the wireless controller to manage every wireless device on the network. And it's constantly feeding back what the signal strengths are for every access point and every device in the area. It gives them the ability to now jump from one access point to the other without even realizing it. Now, if you're talking about Luxel, um, Every access point that Luxel has currently is able to be controlled via their wireless controller. Luxel also has um, wireless controller built into their 1200 wireless router and their 3100 wireless router, or they have their standalone wireless controller. Uh, if we're talking about Ingenious, uh, the Neptune series switches actually have a wireless controller built into them, and you can use their Neptune compatible uh, access points. And with the Ingenious, you can go up to, uh, depending on which switch you do, 50 or more access points. Now with AP placement, and you're using wireless controller, orientation doesn't matter. They're all omnidirectional. The overlap, you want to shoot for negative 60 to negative 70 dB between overlap. Uh, I always would like to have negative 60 or maybe even a little more. Um, with wireless controller, it has the ability to manage much better, so you don't have to worry about that interference as much. Uh, now, signal strength is one thing that is in your control to be able to, to play with. So that's some on wireless. There's stuff, I mean, we've got 20 minutes, guys, so there was a lot more that we can cover, but we're limited on time and what we can talk about. Uh, I know that uh, there is a lot <laughs> and everything is different. I know there's a hundred different manufacturers out there and everybody says stuff a little differently. Um, and I would try and answer as much as I can. Uh, guys, do you guys have any questions? I'm sure I did not cover everything that, we, uh, that you guys have questions on. Questions on wireless, questions on hardwire networks. I know we didn't cover hardwire networks. We are going to in part two. Um, so if you guys have any questions now, I'd love to just take the time and answer them. Uh, if you guys have questions after we off the phone, uh, you can reach out to me or reach out to your local account manager at Capital Sales, and we'd love to chat. If you guys have questions about projects, designs, whatever it is, we'd love to hear about it. Well, if you guys don't have any questions, I want to thank you guys for hopping on, taking the time out of your busy day. Oh, here comes the question. Mesh network versus AP with controller. So that's a great question. All right, because we are hearing a lot more about mesh network uh, versus access points with, you know, with AP controller. Now, that's two different uh, types of equipment altogether. Okay. When you're looking at access point in 
we all know that hardwired is the best solution. Now, a mesh network is not bad, but you're bouncing a signal from one access point to the other access point to the other access point uh, with a mesh network. So keep in mind that there is going to be a, a delay every hop, so every access point is going to add a delay in there. You also have a little more ability to drop packets so it may be a little less robust um, versus having multiple access points all hardwired back to a switch. So just keep that in mind. I'm not saying that mesh networks are bad. That's not it at all. But they are not going to be as reliable as hardwired access points throughout a house. I mean, we all know and we all try to hardwire everything possible. So if you have the ability to hardwire switches, I mean hardwire access points, do that every day of the week over a mesh network. Um, we all know that sometimes that isn't the case and the only way to get it because of it being already pre you know, already built, you're going to retrofit and you can't pull wire, mesh networks do work. I hope that answered your question. Um, mesh networks definitely over repeaters. Try and stay away from repeaters if possible. I know there are certain times you have to put in a repeater, but if you're in a retrofit situation, go mesh network over doing repeaters as well. How many APs on a 1200 router? Great question. Uh, both the 1200 and the 3100 routers have a can support up to two extra access points plus the wireless already built into the routers. So it is a smaller controller that's built into those so it can support up to two extra access points above and beyond the wireless that's built into it. Is there any other questions, guys? I'd love to talk to you guys if you guys have any questions or if you want to chat one-on-one -on -one about a project or about a uh, product. Uh, feel free to give me a call or send me an email. I'd love to chat about anything you guys need. So if there isn't any more questions, guys, I want to thank you guys for taking time out of your day to uh, learn more about wireless and uh, hope to hear from you guys all soon.